Hey, if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Um, if you kind of walked in and you were a few minutes early, you noticed that we ran late in the first service, so I want to tell you that we're probably going to run late in this service, so if you have brunch reservations, hop on your phone, change those right now, okay? You don't want to miss this. This is such an important message as we wrap up our series called Thriving Marriage, right? Thriving Marriage, uh, because I believe one of those things in life is that God didn't design marriage to just survive, He didn't design marriages to die. He actually designed marriages to thrive. I believe that with all of my heart. Um, And I want to help as many people um, experience that and know that in their life as I possibly can because it's the one of the greatest things that I have going for me in my life is my marriage. So we're going to wrap up this series and I hope that you'll lean into this. There's some there's some difficult things that I'm going to say along the way. Some things are going to hurt. Actually, a lot of things are probably going to hurt, but that's good for all of us, right? Because the reality of it is, and I just mentioned this thing that's happening around the world, all of our lives are shaped by different things. You know what I mean? So my life is shaped by um, the way that my, my uh, house was growing up, right? So I grew up, my parents were, were married, they did not divorce. Some of you uh, grew up in a broken home, maybe a single mom, those types of things. And those, those circumstances shape a little bit of your life. My life was also shaped by the fact that for the first 10 years of my life, we went to a church that my grandfather was a pastor of, who was a very um, godly man, and I loved my grandfather, uh, and did incredible things. But the church was in that season was pretty legalistic, right? So I grew up in that kind of a culture of legalism. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit much. And we really didn't talk about some of the things that we're going to talk about today very much. And that shapes my life. My life was also shaped by a basketball coach that I had in middle school and high school, someone that had invested in me a great deal. My life has been shaped by my friends, uh, good friends and bad friends, you know what I'm saying? So I've had some good influences in my life. I've had some not so good influences in my life. And those things have all shaped me. But, and they do that for you as well, by the way. So your life has been shaped by a lot of those same things. Uh, and you've probably, like, if you had friends that were not a great influence on you, you probably made some really dumb decisions like I did along the way. Anybody want to just admit that this morning? Like, yes, I did that, and I, I wish I had not had done that. But you did it, right? But your life is shaped by that. Listen, as we follow Jesus... Our lives should more and more be shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The more that we follow Jesus, the more that our lives should begin to look like Jesus, right? That's what one of the things that we say. We know that God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what he talks about in the book of Romans. Um, He wants us to look like Jesus in, in, in the way that we interact with other people, in the way that we talk, in the way that we live our life, in the way that we carry ourselves, and our lives are shaped by that. And what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is this, right? So the gospel, as defined by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, says this. He says, um, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the first thing. So what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, it means that you're a sinner. Did you know that? Some of you are like, uh, not me. Yep, you. Uh, everybody in the room, you're a sinner. And you need a Savior, and his name's Jesus. Jesus is the only way that you can have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Some of you think that you're going to get to God by your good works, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to fall miserably short. Because you can never be good enough to measure up enough. Right? And so, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, in need of a Savior, so Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He, was, he basically hung on a cross for you according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again, again according to the Scriptures. That's what the Gospel is. And that belief for us begins to shape our life. Matt talked a little bit last week. We've actually sung, sung some songs about the reality of once you step into faith in Christ, right, then God sends his Holy Spirit to actually take up residence in your life. Did you know that? Some of you don't realize that. So when you, when you first believed in Jesus, the, what, what I believe that Scripture teaches us is the moment that I believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, right, takes up residence in my life, which means I have within me and you have within you the full measure of God in us. That's pretty cool, right? And some of you, you, you know, some of you don't have some passion when you're singing some of these songs and you're going ah, to, like, you don't get it. The Holy Spirit is in you. 
So when we talk about the things we talk about as a church, when we're talking to followers of Jesus, listen, the Holy Spirit has given you everything you need to live this life that God is calling you to live. Did you know that? Thank you, one amen. Thank you, Dolores. It's good to have you here. The Holy Spirit of God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given you everything you need to live the life that he is calling you to live. In your marriage, he's given you everything that you need to be able to live in a thriving marriage. He's given that to you as a precious gift and a promise for you to lean into and go, I can't quite figure this out, God, but I know you're with me. And that's where he gets to, right, as as he starts talking. And Ephesians chapter 5 is where we are. And Ephesians chapter 5, as we walk through this particular text, and we got a few other places that we're going to look at, we talk about what it looks like for our lives to be shaped by the gospel. That my life looks different because of my belief in Jesus. My marriage looks different because of my belief in Jesus. My parenting skills look different because of my belief in Jesus. What I'm pursuing in my life is different because of my belief in Jesus. It is shaping me, right? And so tomorrow morning when I give up, get up in the morning, my life should be shaped by Jesus. So let's look at Ephesians 5 uh, beginning in verse 15. So we're going to go 15 through 20. And we're going to talk first, and this is what it looks like. When your life in marriage is shaped by the gospel, the first one is this. You're going to live thoughtfully. You're going to live thoughtfully. And you might go, what in the world does he mean by that? Well, let's look. This is what he says. So be careful how you live. This is what he says in verse 15. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Some of you are living like fools right now. You are. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And this is what he says, verse 17. Don't act thoughtlessly. So the opposite of don't act thoughtlessly, to me, is to live thoughtfully. So I'm going to give consideration to what I am doing in my life and how it impacts the people around me and how it impacts, right, God's glory around me, right? Because I'm carrying around with me the Holy Spirit of God, right? I call myself a follower of Jesus. So, I mean, in my life, I want to make much of Jesus. That's what all of us should want in our life as followers of Jesus. So if this is true, then let's, let's live thoughtfully, Let's live thoughtfully so that tomorrow morning in your marriage in particular, like that's what we're talking about, thriving marriage, men, women coming together, and you're going, how can I do the things that are laid out for me in Scripture today? And I'm going to live as if I am living on purpose because I am. And so I'm thinking about the things that I do today and how they impact my spouse I'm going to live thoughtfully. He goes on to say this. This is where we get a little bit hung up. It says this. Verse 18. Ready? Don't be drunk with wine because, um, because that will ruin your life. I love the way he says that. It's just real simple. New Living Translation. Don't be drunk with wine. It's going to ruin your life. I'll, I would imagine there's, there's some of us in the room who have at one point or another in our life, we have gotten drunk, which means that we drank to excess to the point of not being in control, right? And we made a really bad decision. Anybody? I'm just kidding. You don't have to raise your hand for that. Some of you were about to, though. I know that. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? And this, this is a tough one. And, and I know, we, we all, everybody has a different view. Like, should I drink? Should I not drink? Should I drink? Should I not drink? Is it wrong for me to drink? Is it okay for me to drink? And then we frown on people that do drink or don't drink. And blah, blah. This is what he's talking about in this particular text. He says, don't drink to excess where you are no longer able to be controlled by the Spirit. Now, if that means that you're somebody who has a tendency to drink to excess, then let me just say this. Stop it. Just stop. Make a decision in your life to not drink. I will tell you this, and you probably can testify to it. I hear more stories about 
people who decide to take one drink that leads to more drinks and then something really bad happens than I do from people who say they've chosen not to drink at all. I'm just throwing it out there. And I, and I get it. Like, what's permissible? What should I do or could I do? And all of those things. I get all of that. This is a gray area in Scripture. I want to be real honest about it. It's a gray area in Scripture. But at the end of the day, you have to decide. If you're going to live thoughtfully and you're going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit in your life, then maybe it's time for you to make a decision in this particular area of your life. And oh, by the way, then it's not just about wine, but it's really about the excess things that the world is offering you. That's, that's one of the big pictures that we are battling against as we follow Jesus. The world is offering us all of these things, and they seem so good and enticing and right and perfect. And we're like, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And then what happens is we become consumed by them instead of consumed by the Spirit. So which kind of person do you want to be? If you're going to live thoughtfully, you're going to go, well, I want to be consumed and I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, which means I need to start saying no to some of the things that the world needs to offer. And even if those things might seem good, because those good things become God things way too fast. Way too fast. Your one takeaway today might be simply that you're going to put away the drink that's in your home and you're going to stop just because, as he says, don't get drunk with wine, it's going to ruin your life. Your, your one takeaway might be that you're going to stop living in excess. You're going to stop pursuing the things the world offers in excess. And you're going to say, you know what, I want to be consumed and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God living in me. That's how I'm going to live thoughtfully today because that's what he's talking about right? He goes on. That makes everybody uncomfortable. Whenever we talk about alcohol, it's like alcohol and sex are the two things that nobody wants to talk about in the church. And we're talking about both of them today. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing. He, he goes on, like this is what it begins to look like, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So when you become consumed and controlled by the Spirit, yep, you might sound a little crazy sometimes. Most of us only like to sing in the shower. We don't want everybody else to hear us. I'm, I'm that kind of person. right? But we should, be, we should be having our hearts stirred and our affections stirred towards what God is doing. And it's always a constant reminder for us that every good and perfect gift that we have is coming from above. These are not things that I've, I, I've figured out on my own or done on my own or pulled myself up by my bootstraps and figured it out. And those type, nope, everything that we have is a gift from God. And if we will begin to enjoy that gift in that way, in the way that God designed it, will keep us from dabbling in the excess that the world is offering all of us. Okay, so that's the first one. Live thoughtfully. Live thoughtfully. Number two, if you're somebody who takes notes, right, the, the, this is what it looks like. Submit mutually. Submit mutually. And here's what I'm talking about. We, Matt began to touch on this a little bit last week as he, as he touched on uh, Ephesians 5. He talked a little bit about that. He, went to, he was talking about 1 Corinthians 13 as well. But submit mutually looks like this. Because a lot of us get to, you've probably heard different messages on marriage in the past, and we always get to this place of wives should submit to their husbands. How many of you have heard that? Right? Most of us have heard that. Husbands, you should love your wives. We're going to get to that. And most of us have heard that. But this is where it all starts. It all starts when we decide to submit mutually. And here's what I mean. Verse 21 says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Right? And so some of us, we jump to the second part and we skip the first part right? There's husbands out there, they're like, woman, you should submit to me. It's like, yeah, but you kind of missed the first part. The first part is that you, you are recognizing one another, and you are submitting to one another. But it all started, why? Because you stopped being drunk with wine and living in a world of excess, and instead you decided to submit to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. That's where it started. That allows you, empowers you, enables you to submit to one another, and then as you submit to one another, then yes, it means husbands, 
love their wives, but wives, yes, they submit to their husbands. And it doesn't mean that you check yourself at the door. It doesn't mean that you become a doormat. It just simply means that you are choosing to honor what God has designed. And I know some people kind of bow up at that. They're like, ah! And I want to tell you, God designed it this way. If you have a problem with it, take it up with him. Seriously? And I, you know, we enter into conversations with people at different times, and, they, and it doesn't mean that women are less valued. In fact, one of the great hallmarks of Jesus' ministry is the value that he brought to women and the way that he treated women that nobody else did in his culture. I mean, it was, it was revolutionary. And so don't misunderstand what we're talking about. It doesn't mean that we don't have, uh, hold women with high value, but it does mean that me, uh, God has called men to lead in this capacity. And he has. And he's repeated it over and over in Scripture from the very beginning. And, and I know some people get really, they get hung up on this, but let me remind you. If, if you, and I do, I believe in the inerrancy of all of the Scripture, so I believe that the account of creation is true. And I believe that when Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, they were told not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, and they decided to eat of it. Do you remember this story? A serpent came walking up to Eve. It wasn't crawling at the time. That was one of the results of the curse. And came walking up to Eve and entices her. I don't know what kind of fruit it was, but you know, we say it's an apple. I don't know if it was an apple or not. It probably wasn't. It was probably something way better than an apple. And he said, like, here is this fruit. You should eat of it. And she's like, well, I really shouldn't. But he's like, oh, God's holding out on you. And Eve goes to Adam and, and says, hey, I think we should eat of this tree. I'm paraphrasing this, by the way. And, and we should eat this fruit. And Adam's like, well, okay, if you think it's a good idea, let's eat of it. And so they eat of the tree, and then they realize, like, oh, we're naked. Like, that's one of the first things that they realize. So they cover themselves in fig leaves. And then God comes looking for them. You remember this? And who does he call out for? He calls out for Adam. He says, Adam, where are you? And I believe as you continue to trace that throughout Scripture, right, that men are to lead in this way. I just believe it. Again, you can get mad at me, but take it up with him. He designed it this way. I believe, men, you will be held accountable and responsible for how you lead your families. Women are to submit, but it starts in mutual submission. You're not lording it over them. That's not what you're doing. You've already submitted to the person that your wife is, and now you're going to lead her in that way. This is what it looks like, right? First, it means that you're going to serve selflessly. You're going to serve selflessly, and this is the example he gives beginning in verse um, 23. For husband, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church, as the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. So you, you're getting to that place of you're, you're, you're understanding this is, my, this is my role. You're beginning to see how it's laid out in Scripture. For husbands, this means love your wives, right? So going back to the very first thing that he said, the very first thing he said in this particular paragraph is submit to one another, right, out of reverence for Christ. For wives, it looks like this. For husbands, it looks like this. This is what it means for you to submit to one another. Husbands are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. That means you're going to serve them selflessly. Wives are going to submit to their husbands. And what does that mean? That means you're going to serve selflessly. And that's really, really hard in a time, in an age, where we are consumed with selfishness. It's really hard, right? To open our hands up and decide that we're going to serve selflessly. And so we get, we get hung up on the, well, I don't want to submit to my husband. I don't think that's the way that it should be. And I, again, take it up with him. But see, as you follow Christ, you're dying to self. And I think we forget that. If anyone wants to follow me, he tells us in the Gospel of Luke, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. So it, honestly, this hurts. Just put your toe out. Let's just stomp on it real fast together. It doesn't matter what you think or what you think is right. 
This is about what God has laid out in the example that he gives us in Scripture. And so we're choosing to follow this. So we're going to serve selflessly, which means we're going to die to self. We're going to step into our marriages. And by the way, this isn't just about marriage. Like you can apply a lot of these principles to every relationship in your life. You're going to serve selflessly. And for men, this is, this is for you, just for men. This means that you're going to learn to lead graciously. Graciously. So <laughs> this is a tough one. Because, I mean, you know, some of, some of us are kind of passionate. Some of us aren't, but some of us are passionate. And so it's like, it, it's easy for you to get to this place like, nope, you're going you're gonna to obey me, and you're going to do what I say, and you're going to da 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 And that's not at all the example that you find in Scripture. Because lead graciously means like you're, you're gracious, grace, you're extending grace, you're being gracious, you're walking with your wife in an understanding way. That's what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, you're, you're understanding, like you're giving her honor as a weaker vessel. And as you do that, it gives honor to Christ. Women, it doesn't mean that you're weak. That's not what that means. But it means that you, you should have a, a man, you should have a husband who is standing up for you, that is leading you. And he's saying, hey, come and follow after Jesus. As I follow Jesus, follow me. That's the way Paul would say it. If he were married, he wouldn't, we don't think he was married, right? So he would say, follow Jesus the way that I'm following Jesus. Follow after me in the way that I am leading you because I love you. I want what's best for you. I want to protect you. I want to cherish you. I want to honor you. I want to do all of these things. And so, you men, you're leading that kind of way. That's, that, that's what it means to lead graciously. And most of the guys right now are going, oh. And I'm with you. It's hard. It's not easy. And I feel some days I fail more than I succeed at it. I really do. But it doesn't keep me from trying. It doesn't keep me from leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit in my life going, God, I can't do this on my own. And by the way, men, if your wife is somebody who is following Jesus and she's watching you, she would like nothing more than to see you lean into the power of the Holy Spirit to lead her the way that Paul is laying out in Ephesians chapter 5. In fact, for your wife, she's going to go, yes, that's what I want in my life. That's what I want. So you're going to learn to lead graciously, understanding her, bringing her along. You're going to cherish her, those vows that you said, right? I'm going to love and cherish you. I'm going to honor and protect you. You, and this is what it should look like, you can count on me. You can count on me. So you're going to lead graciously, right? Right? Let's, let's finish reading what he says, and then I have two other things I, wanna, I just want to point out to you. For husbands, this means love your wives. Verse 25, just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love your wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are all members of his body. So he's given us an example of what this looks like. Men, you got up, you showered, you took care of yourself today. You're going to get some kind of a meal a little bit later. You're going to take care of yourself. You're going to provide for yourself. And in the same way, he's like, bring your wife along with that. That's what you're looking at, right? As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And this is important. I want to say this. One of the most important things for you in your marriage is for you to understand that you guys are one. You come together as one. I don't do a whole lot of counseling. I really don't. But one of the things that I'm really passionate about is getting to this place of oneness. And it all starts, by the way, with finances. And if, by the way, if you're in a marriage right now and it's his money and her money, then you're getting it wrong. You're getting it wrong. Because Scripture was very clear. The two shall become one. And when it's his money and her money, right? 
So what, need, what, what happens? Like who's, who's supporting, who's giving, who's doing what? Like it, it begins to crumble and fall apart. It really does. And so you want to get to this place of you're pursuing oneness together. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father, and he will, it's the leave and cleave principle, that's what we call it. He will cleave or hold on to his wife, and the two become one. Two independent people become one. Two people that are earning incomes and might have two houses and two this and two that, they become one. And they're pursuing oneness together, right? The, the husband's not looking at it going, well, you got to give up all your stuff. No, 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 no. I've joked in the past. I have one item, one item in my house, and I still have it, that I call was PK. And it means pre-carry. I have one item, right? So we're not holding on to these things going, oh, I got this thing. And that's just because we haven't replaced it. It's just a griddle. It's not even that big of a deal. But and she may have thrown it out. I may not even know we have it anymore anyway. But it's, those, it's that thing. Like we're pursuing oneness. It's not his and hers. It's ours. We're pursuing oneness together. That's what, that's what he's talking about in this. So he goes on. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man, this is just, I love the way he repeats it. This, uh, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. That's the whole love and respect. There's a book in the back, if you want a resource, love and respect. And it's basically this. Husbands are to love your wives. Wives are to respect or submit to your husbands. And when that is working, man, it's beautiful. And then something happens, and the wife or the husband responds unlovingly and the wife decides she's no longer going to respect or submit and it's, you get on the crazy train at that point. And the cycle of responding unlovingly and disrespectfully continues. And here's, here's what I want to say to you today. Somebody in the marriage needs to decide that they're going to break the cycle. And they're going to decide to break the cycle even when the other one doesn't decide to break the cycle. So for husbands, it might mean that, yep, you're loving your wife as Christ loved the church and you're loving your wife as yourself, even though she might be responding in a lack of submission and disrespect. But guess what? It doesn't give you permission to act unlovingly. You're going to continue to love her and love her and love her and love her. Women. He talks about submitting, submitting, submitting. And it's like, I don't want to. It doesn't matter if you want to. You've got to break the cycle. Through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you can do it. Now, I will say this. I understand there are some circumstances where it's not possible. And if you are in any kind of danger, physically, emotionally, or spiritually, and you are experiencing any kind of abuse, let's have a different conversation. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that if he is even responding unlovingly, you can submit with respect. And you can decide to be the one through the power of the Holy Spirit to break the cycle. And I would even contend to say that if you go and read 1 Peter chapter 3, I believe that 1 Peter chapter 3 becomes a promise to you as a wife that your, um, your uh, how would you say it? The way that you respond becomes the way that you win your husband over. It, it, it doesn't say that it's going to happen overnight either. Just throwing that out there. It might take a really long time. But you're going to choose to break the cycle. Okay, two more things. Uh, two more things and I'm done. I told you we were going to be a little bit long. Um, and, and the first one is this. Uh, when your life... In your marriage is shaped by the gospel. We forgive freely. Ooh. Paul David Tripp says, he said this years ago, but he made the point. He says, every morning you wake up with the worst of sinners. And it's not the person next to you. It's actually you. And some of us don't believe that. But it's true. And a lot of us live in our marriages and we're blaming the other person. We're blaming the other person. We're blaming the other person. And what I want to say is maybe it's time for you and I to get to this place where we're going to forgive freely. Because guess what? Because you've been forgiven. 
Jesus Christ in the gospel, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And when he died for our sins according to the scriptures, the Lord doesn't bring them up against us any longer. In fact, what we see in scripture is that he's forgiven our sins and forgotten them as far as the east is from the west. That's, that's what we're told. And so you learn to forgive freely. This is what it looks like, Colossians chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 13. If you, if you get there, you can write it down. It says this, make allowances for each other's faults. I love that. I mean, you got a, you got a list of faults in your spouse? Anybody you want to admit? <laughs> no, nobody wants to admit that. But make allowances for each other's faults, he says. Um, and forgive Anyone who offends you, because remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must also forgive others. That's pretty cut and dry. You can do it. Through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, you can do that. You can forgive freely. What does that look like? Well, Matt talked last week, Pastor Matt talked in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, he was reminiscing about his wedding day, and many of you were probably reminiscing about your wedding days as well when you read this. And he says this, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Ah, it's wonderful. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no, this is where you get to forgiveness, it keeps no record of wrong. It, it keeps no record of wrong. That means that when you're in that argument with your spouse and you begin to bring up something from your past or their past and you're holding it against them, that, that means that you're, you're responding unlovingly. Because love, as described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, says love keeps no record of wrong. And so we're not bringing those things up. I've made, I've made a bunch and bunch of mistakes in my marriage. I have. Some of them are massive mistakes. Some of them are little mistakes. I've been incredibly blessed with a wife that does not hold those things against me. Because some of them have hurt us in different ways. And she doesn't hold it against me. She doesn't bring it up and say, you remember when you did this? Like, that was really stupid. So it keeps no record of wrong. You're going to forgive. Forgive means that you are no longer holding that person responsible. You're going to release them from any kind of a debt that they might owe you or feeling like you, maybe you feel like you're entitled to or owed an apology. And Nope. You're just wiping your hands and going, I don't need to hold on to that. And so when we're arguing, I've let that go. When we're talking, I've let that go. Because I'm not keeping a record of wrong. And if you, have a, if you have a journal, Matt joked about a journal last week, and if you have a journal, maybe you should throw that in the fire when you have a fire outside. I'm done with it. I'm no longer going to hold them responsible for it. I'm setting them free. And by doing that, you'll be set free. That's the one thing. And then my last thing is this. <laughs> I think, I think we've got to get to a place as couples where we love passionately. And I know you're going, what? This is what most people think. And I'll be honest, like, there, yeah, in some ways I, I mean what I say with that. Like, when you think passionately and you're thinking, like, you know, intimately, yeah, I mean that too. I do. I told you, in the church, we don't talk about certain things. Sex has been one of them for a long time. Churches don't talk about sex. But I'll be honest, like God gave it to us, and it is wonderful when it is inside of marriage. And it should be. And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. And we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. And, yep, I, and so think of it this way. Like when you love passionately, first, yep, I, I want to say it's okay for you to think of it that way. And for you to love your husband and wife, and you think of it in an intimate way, and I know there's kids in the room and all of that, and I get that, but I, you know what? Love like it's nobody's business, because it's not. Like it's your business. It's okay for you to feel that way. My kids get grossed out when we're kissing or doing something like that in the house, like, oh, dad, mom, you know what? Keep doing that kind of stuff. Seriously, like keep doing that kind of stuff so your kids are like, eh, that's kind of gross. And you're like, yep. 
You know what? But we love one another passionately in a way that, yep, they're watching us and they're going, that grosses me out. And you're like, good, it should gross you out until the day you get married. That's what I'm talking about. But love passionately. And here's the other side of it. Like, if, if that scares you a little bit, here, here's the other side of it. It's okay for you to go all in with your marriage. Like, we're not, we're not just going halfway. We're not putting 50% of an effort into this. It's like, no, when I'm talking about loving passionately, I'm also reminding you that you are loved passionately by the God of the universe in such a way that he sent his one and only son into this world to die on a cross for you. He didn't go halfway. And some of you every day are trying to mail it in in your marriage. And you're going halfway. And like you're just showing up and checking the boxes. I know I do that sometimes in my life too. We got to get to this place where no, we're going to love passionately. We're going to pursue it with everything that we have. Because here's something to remember. One day, you're not going to have a job anymore. One day, your kids are going to be growing out of the house. One day, your grandkids aren't going to want anything to do with you. One day, all of those things are going to happen. And guess who you have the opportunity to have right there with you? Your spouse. So yes, love passionately. Because here's what's happening in our culture. We don't talk about it. So what begins to happen with different people is that they, right, reconnect with somebody other than their spouse. Sometimes it's they reconnect with somebody from their past, and they're doing that through Facebook or Instagram, or they connect with somebody and they start sending text messages that are inappropriate for you to be sending that kind of a text message to somebody that you're not married to. And some of you are probably in that world right now, right this minute, and you're tempted to send that text, you're tempted to send that kind of a picture. We heard it from John Crosby when he came here for our marriage event, and here's what John and I talked about. John and I, as he was telling me that same story, I said, you know, John, wouldn't it be great if instead of texting somebody outside of our marriage that inappropriate stuff, what if we just said, I'm going to send that to my spouse? I know, right? Like, thank you. Thank you very much. And I know we, we, so we sit there and we go, nope, 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 nope. Listen, a bunch of church people, it's okay for you to have a relationship with your spouse that is intimate like that. It's okay for you to send something and to write a love letter and to talk about things that you think are taboo because it's way better for you to do that with your spouse than it is for you to do it with somebody who's not your spouse. And for some people, that hits way too close to home, and I get it. But what if, what if we decided to go all in with our marriage? And what if, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we said, I'm going to give it everything I've got? So here's my plea before, we're just going to sing a little bit of a song before we leave. Here it is. If you're here today, if you're watching online, and you feel like you're about to call it quits in your marriage, please don't do it yet. And I'm I'm making myself available. I know you may not know who to talk to, so come talk to me. Come and talk to me. Let's have a conversation. I'll do whatever I can to help you. I'm, I'm not perfect. I don't get it right all the time. Never have. But I believe that God designed marriage to thrive. I believe that it should be the best and safest relationship that you have in this world. And I know that's true for me in my life, and I want it to be true for you in your life as well. And so if you are here and you're thinking about calling it quits, if you're thinking about throwing in the towel, and you don't know who to talk to, then come talk to me. You can send me an email through our church website. I will stand right down here at the end of the service. You just come and talk to me. I will find a way to make time for every person that wants to talk about it. Because it's that important to me. It's that important to me. And I know I'm not the only one. I know there's other people on our team. There's other people in our church that will step in and they will help in whatever way and whatever capacity that we can. So if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about sending that message that might be inappropriate to somebody that's not your wife, 
right? If you're thinking about giving it less than 100% tomorrow morning, then come and talk. Don't just call it quits. Because here's the thing. When I read 1 Peter and 2 Peter and I read Ephesians, here's the thing I want you to know. God doesn't want you to call it quits. God wants you to have a growing, thriving marriage that can be the best and safest relationship in your life apart from your relationship with him. I believe that with all my heart. So don't give up. Please don't give up. Let me pray for us, and we're going to sing just a little bit of a song before we close our time. Father, thank you for the truth of your word today. Lord, thank you for my wife that is so gracious and kind towards me. Thank you that through the years you've helped us be able to talk through the the problems that we have, to be able to continue to go all in every day of our life and in our marriage. And I pray that for those in this room right now that are thinking about calling it quits, I pray that you would rescue them and rescue their marriage, bring about reconciliation, help them to humble themselves, submit to one another out of reverence and honor for you. Father, help them. Help them to be bold enough to ask for help. Give them courage to ask for help so that they can experience what you have laid out in your word, that their marriage and their relationship with their spouse can be the best and safest relationship they have on this planet apart from you. For your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.